Okay. We're live. Had a little bit of trouble connecting. <laughs> it wanted me to connect streaming software, which I clearly was incapable of connecting. But I'll get it figured out. All right, let's see. Let's see if I can go over to that other stream and close it. Looks like we got some folks showing up. Go ahead, shoot me a text in the window there if you can see this. I'm wondering if I should close the other stream that I had set up. Hey, Squiddy Gang. This has been kind of a busy Saturday morning. Just watched my daughter play volleyball, which was super fun. I'm actually heading back there for another game a little bit later on today. But I've been looking forward to this all week. I think maybe, maybe I'll try to cancel that other live stream in case there's people in there. Maybe they're more likely to find this one. Hey, XXX Games. Just living the dream. It is a hot one here. I thought it was winter when I woke up and it was 70 degrees, but it is become progressively hot. So I think we still might have other people over in that other stream. I'm going to go ahead and give, give it a try. Got to cancel that one. Okay, good. Okay. All right, I deleted that one. It's cold in Louisiana, Squiddy Gang. How cold is cold? And by the way, this is going to be one of the sweatiest Eat Your Backyard podcasts ever. That's why I brought my dolphin skin sweat wiping rag. Super cold. Yeah. <laughs> That's cold enough. As soon as it gets below 70 degrees, I start to shiver. I've just been acclimatized to this weather here. Yeah, so there are a couple of mulberry trees in the neighborhood that I admire uh, that are not ever bearing mulberries. That's the most popular mulberry tree I, I know of in this area. Uh, and like I've said on the channel before, it, it's the kind of tree that will fill in gaps in, in your year round fruit production capability, which is really a goal of mine, which I've achieved and now I can grow. But in order to achieve that, one of the things I realized is you have to have these filler plants that are either ever bearing or fill in the gaps in the seasons of your trees that only bear or plants that only bear during certain times of the year, like a mango tree, let's say, or citrus. Now within those varieties of trees, you can get certain types that will, you know, you can stagger it. So if you're going to be getting into mango tree growing, that's something to pay attention to, which is when does the fruit become ripe? You know, if you plant it, you can have, the ripeness of one end as the ripeness of the next begins and have a longer mango eating period. But so I, I looked at, I've been looking at these trees and uh, one of my neighbors that lives a few blocks away from me, I, I just decided I'm going to go ahead and ask them if I can take a cutting. And I did. So thank you to Mark and Sarah for allowing me to take a cutting from their Persian. They actually sent me a text to let me know the variety of it. Um, yeah, and I'll take a look to see. And they say it is a P 
Persian mulberry. Persian mulberry. So I went and grabbed a few little cuttings and uh, he had said he was gonna trim it back anyway. So now is the time. Now, when I take cuttings from a tree, you don't need much, you know, and, but there are a few simple kind of rules that I like to follow, which I want to believe help the success of, uh, of the cuttings. Now, one of the things is that when I take the cutting, I like to, like if you cut a flower, same idea, you take the cutting and then put it into water right away. Like you would a flower, like you would um, really a, yeah, a flower. So I, I took the cutting, put it right into what I do is I get a five gallon bucket. I just put a gallon of water in there from the hose and then I put those cuttings in there. So I grabbed a few cuttings from that Persian mulberry tree. And I also grabbed some cuttings from the everbearing mulberry. And I think maybe I'll just start by, by showing you. I got here, so. Okay, I'm trying not to get water in the laptop, but there you go. Persian mulberry. Now you can see it's, you know, it's the end of the season, right? So uh, these leaves are getting ready to fall off, certainly. You know, in Florida, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trees that are evergreen, right? But this is a deciduous type of tree, which is unusual. I've heard folks who grew up in Florida, when the leaves fall off the tree, they go, the tree died. And I was like, no, trees actually do drop their leaves in the winter. And uh, this is one of them. So they get a little ratty towards the end of the year. Mine are getting ratty as well. But the everbearing mulberry will just keep producing, you know, leaves pretty much year round. I'd say a lot of the kind of fruit trees that we have in Florida that weren't necessarily, uh, you know, Southern trees, they almost get confused. I've seen my fig tree behave like that, where the, it's, it wants to start, you know, start growing leaves too early and, uh, you know, so it comes in spurts. Yeah, Jonathan, you like those evergreens. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? So, yeah, gigantic leaves. And you can compare that with this, which is an everbearing mulberry tree. You see that the size difference of the leaves is dramatic. I mean, yeah, the comparison is quite easy to see. This one actually, this everbearing mulberry has got some fruit that's coming in, which is kind of one of the cool things about the, the everbearing mulberry tree is that it's everbearing. But yeah, I can pretty much count on this tree producing fruit uh, year round, but I've grown so many of them that I'd almost say I went overboard. All right, so let's let's talk about a couple more rules that I like to follow to, to get success. So the one thing is to put them into the water right away. Uh, and I do one other thing, which is I try to reduce the amount of, of, ins of cuts that I make on the cutting. So in other words, you know, I cut this fairly close to the base of the trunk and then I cut it short enough so that I don't have to shorten the length of the cutting. You know, I might, if I was going to shorten it, I would shorten it up this way. You know, another thing is I, I do like to use water with a little bit of chlorine in it, meaning, you know, from the hose. And I think that helps just to have a little bit of chlorine in case there's any bacteria. You know, you could think of these as little tubes that run up, you know, this trunk as little tubes that run up through this. So you don't want any yucky stuff growing in there. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, I know that these leaves are going to fall off, that they're going to die. And uh, one way is to just let them turn brown and fall off. Uh, I typically just will, will break off a couple. You know, and, I, and you can see on this tree, there are really, really healthy little buds here that are ready to go.
And since I know they're all going to fall off anyway, I'm gonna take them all off. And if I leave this leaf on this cutting, and you can see it's a windy day. You see all the leaves blowing behind me. Um, I don't want it blowing around. I want it to be static so that it has a chance to, you know, the worst thing you can do is if it's spiraling in the place where you planted it. So Squiddy Gang never ate a mulberry. <laughs> I'm gonna put this in the water. Well, it's time to eat one. It's time to get one growing. In fact, these grow well even indoors. So uh, to me, this is the most bang for your buck or your time is a mulberry tree. I grew up with mulberry trees in, in my youth, so I even have a sentimental connection to mulberry trees. But as we look at the mulberry tree, uh, a lot of it's edible. You know, they use mulberry trees to feed silkworms. That's a really big use of mulberries is to grow it and then uh, use the leaves for, uh, for feeding the silkworms. And uh, they'll chow this down and produce great silk. Uh, you can also eat the leaves. You can actually eat them. <laughs> but you wouldn't want to in my opinion. Uh, I've heard of people actually making tea with them. And actually, years ago, I had one viewer that told me that they use this. There's an elephant farm in central Florida, an elephant ranch. I don't know what you call it exactly, but they feed the elephants mulberry leaves. And they're just prolific producers of leaves. So the other thing is they love to be trimmed. So as soon as you trim that, I, my approach is really to trim them often because if you don't, I found they get kind of tired. You know, they, they kind of slow down in growth, become less vigorous. M one of my secrets to success besides planting lots of fish waste around the mulberry tree. Oh yeah, Patricia. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So one of the secrets to success is uh, trimming them back but in a certain sequence. Now, what I like to do is to, is to trim them back and then subsequently plant fish waste around the roots. So you, you're trimming it back to encourage it to sprout and it'll burst forth with sprouts. Uh, and then you're providing it with the nutrients to produce that new, that new growth. Yeah, but just gonna hold up so grateful that they let me pick pick a cutting. Now, why do we like to grow things? You know, I've asked myself that. Why am I so, you know, drawn to growing things? And and uh, I think one of the reasons is the novelty, the variety of it. But within a certain type of plant or tree, you know, you really have a lot of options in terms of climate, in terms of the way the fruit looks, all kinds of things. So the everbearing mulberry produces a fairly small mulberry, very tasty, very tart. I like to get actually, if you've seen our other videos, I like to get the red ones, the unripe, really tart ones with the black mulberries, which are much more sweet. I think you gotta get a couple of each and a handful. Although I would caution you about eating more than two cups of mulberries. Anybody on this chat ever ate two cups of mulberries? It's easy to do. It's easy to do. You can, you know, any fruit experience, uh, you can just start eating and eating and eating before you know it. Well, mulberries, besides being very high in antioxidants and certainly contain vitamin C, uh, the other thing is that it gets your system moving. So, <laughs> You know, something like prunes. Another thing I like, yeah, yeah, Squiddy, haven't done the two, two cups of mulberry challenge yet. Yeah, I've done it several times. And uh, it's like at, at one point you just, uh-oh. Uh <laughs> 
Yeah. I'll, one of the things I'm curious about is making tea with the leaves. I've never done that, but I think that would be kind of cool to do. Okay, so keep on rolling. All right, so I brought some of these pots. By the way, I love these pots. It's cheap. It's like eight bucks. I got 50 of these things. Before I get too far, though, I want to say if you want to support the channel, the best thing is to click on the links in the description. And uh, really, that just, you know, if you click on the links to Amazon or whatever, then anything that you get there, you know, they, they give a little kick back to me. And I use that to pay for camera gear. So uh, one of the things I'm doing is setting up my uh, one of the rooms in my house to be able to live stream in the evening. So I'm getting some some lights and things like that. Not going to go too far, but just enough so that it's kind of comfortable place to do it because I enjoy it. All right. So I've got that just regular old Miracle Grove soil in there, which I tend to prefer because. Oh, wow. Yeah, I tend to prefer because it's produced success for me in the past. So I'm going to plant them in a way that there we go. I've got a spinner that they don't move around much. And the other thing is, so you can see this one, if I shake it, it's not going to move that much. The other thing is, I want to give myself multiple chances to win. Yeah, here we go. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah, it's soaking wet. I'm going to try not to drip water into the laptop, but we'll see how that goes. And I'm just going to throw the leaves out of the, into the yard. That's another great thing about the mulberry tree, is the leaves disintegrate very easily. Hey, Squeedy Gang says, do you need fertilizer? I think you do. I think you do. And I would say that here, in, in my yard, the consistency of the soil is something like beach sand. You know, a little bit of organic material. So I, I enrich it. Usually I use a little bit of what they, they sell. 50% uh, peat, 50% cow manure. So compost, that kind of thing. So enrich the soil here. That's very important. I think we're kind of lucky in this area and that the soils are very loose. So the, the root growth is, is easy for the plant, but the drawback is if you don't keep it watered, it can dry out very quickly. So although Florida gets a lot of rain, it's very hot. So that, that, you know, that moisture evaporates up out of the soil. Uh, so what I use for the mulberries, what I like to use for just about everything in my yard, I, I try not to overcomplicate the fertilizers, although I do use palm fertilizers for palms. I, I do have some specific things like that. Um, but what I typically use is fish waste. And that could be either a fish itself. <laughs> you know, we caught a fish and uh, you eat the fish, but the part you don't eat, you plant near the tree. I've said my, my yard is like a fish cemetery in some ways. Um, I grew up hearing the stories of of uh, you know, Native Americans teaching the pilgrims to to uh, plant a fish by every corn plant. I don't know if that's true. It doesn't really even matter to me if it's true, but I love the idea. And when you plant a fish at the base of a tree, you can see I mean, it, it's something about that the nitrogen release uh, that that I think just is great for fruit and great for producing you know the, the the leaves itself, which is really going to be what powers the growth of the fruit. Waking pleb. Arborist wood chips create good soil. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I uh, try to use as much as I can from the local yard. So I, I ha have a giant oak tree in my front yard, which is a whole other story. I'm going to have to deal with that eventually. It drops a lot of leaves, and I use those leaves for mulch around the yard, which helps. So whenever we can, kind of try to use what we've got available at the time. Okay, so we've got two cuttings planted, but I'm going to go with three here, and then I'm going to pack them down beforehand. And I'll water all these things afterwards. Well, actually, what I do is typically I just use the, the water that's in the bucket that I use to keep them in. Okay. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> Persian mulberries. 
exactly what the doctor ordered. And there you go. And that's about it. But you see, this one starts to spin. Yeah, that's the issue. But once we pack it down a little bit, water it, it'll be much more sturdy architecture in this pot. But I'm going to put that over on the grow table and uh, keep it watered so we can track the progress of these per Persian mulberries. Now, if all three of these mulberries sprout, which is, is possible, I think it's likely actually, but I have never grown this specific type before. I've grown other types of mulberries and they all seem to be very easy to grow, but it could be that all three of these begin to grow, which would be great. And then I'll separate them before they get too intermingled because I don't want to cut the roots too much. Yeah, the electric kids farm, fam. Oak trees scare you. Yeah, they scare me too. They really, they really do. Have you heard the expression "smoke on oak"? You know, I can say there are a lot of soft wooded trees in my yard, like mangoes, which are very flexible. Figs, oak, although flexible, just so dense. And if you've ever seen an oak tree topple in a hurricane, um, you know that the root pan of that of that tree extends out really usually until the to the edge of the canopy of that of that oak tree and so that when that thing goes that root pan though that root the roots kind of spread out in the pan underneath the tree will lift up and if that is under your house <laughs> or under a sidewalk or whatever it is that's coming up too and they're so incredibly strong that you, know, you just gotta gotta think it over before you plant one and the other thing is Planting an oak tree, planting, it can become a thing that is almost untenable, unable to be dealt with without the high potential of a hospital visit. I'll tell you a story my neighbor Fred um, is involved in. <laughs> I, years ago, when I was younger, I decided I was going to go and trim the oak tree by climbing up in it and with a sawzall, which is just uh, incredibly stupid. But at the time, it made perfect sense. So you get up into the oak tree, and uh, eventually, you're doing one of these. You've got the, the sawzall out on the end of your hand, and you're kind of counterbalancing on a limb. I mean, you almost get lost in the flow of the experience of trimming the oak tree. And, and I was, certainly. And uh, Fred drove by, and he said... Uh, Hey, don't you think you should be using a chainsaw for that? I said, oh, yeah. He goes, no, man. You shouldn't be up there on the edge of a limb with your hand extended. What are you doing? And then it occurred, yeah, that's right. You don't. But now the thing is so big, and you get an emotional attachment to these trees, that it, I'm about $1,000 away from you know, getting it dealt with by an arborist or somebody who actually knows what they're doing and is insured and so on and so forth. And the other thing is now we put all kinds of emotional attachments on the, the oak tree. <laughs> it has branches that my children have all, several of them on the, in the live chat right now, have, have uh, played on, climbed on, they have had giggle fest swinging on them balancing on the branches we have one branch that dips down very low and i, I always call it my forest gump branch because you know that what do you say I, you know we go to the oak tree and dangle you know and then a very in a very uh classic southern laurel oak looking gigantic old growth tree and they get up on one of these branches and yeah they're amazing now you put that thing next on a quarter acre lot in a standard you know, neighborhood, and you've got a force to be reckoned with. So yeah, they scare me too, a little bit. When I moved into this house 20 years ago, the oak tree in my front yard is about this wide. Well, I used the, the diameter of the trunk. Uh, my neighbor's tree was the same size. They planted them about the same time. And so I went about planting fish around them. Uh, but the other thing was, oh, I didn't tell you about the other fertilizer technique. I use just basically Scott's Bonus S fertilizer, which is just a standard lawn fertilizer you can get at your local store or online or whatever. I, I love that stuff for the lawn. 
granular fertilizer and you can very, you know, you can be very careful about applying it. I'm try, I try to be very careful for there not to be runoff you know, planted at the right time so that it gets watered into the soil. We don't have a lot of runoff. I don't want that stuff going into the uh, Indian River Lagoon or elsewhere. I want it to go to the plants. And um, yeah, so, but I, I use that with just a, a spreader and then I water, water it in to make sure it doesn't run off. And you don't want to put down the fertilizer right before a torrential downpour, right? Because then it can just wash away. So really the trick is kind of watch the, watch the weather. And when you think there's going to be some light rain or a day where it'll kind of rain sporadically, that, that to me is a, is a good time to plant. Yeah. The, that cool boy five. Yeah. Palm tree roots go straight down. Yeah. It's the truth. If you've ever seen, say, a sable palm that has been pulled out, you know, or fallen over, uh, yeah, it, it almost—it's um, just like thousands of roots just extending in every direction, down sideways. So, and what you'll see is in the hurricanes, you know, what's left standing. <laughs> Sorry about that. What's left standing are typically the palm trees. They got that strong base. Yeah. Okay. So now let's plant these. Now I, I have some already growing over on the table there, some everbearing mulberries. You can see that the leaves are already starting to get wilty, right? Even in the water, they're starting to get wilty. And I'm not concerned about that. I, I knew that would happen. Uh, this one wouldn't really be my what I do want though and this one's kind of tricky because it's you can see there's woody growth on the cutting like this and then there's that newer growth or that green growth you know the, ch the chances of the green growth making it through the stuff that's on the end here are very low so if you can get an all woody cutting I think you're a lot better off and these little dots on the tree actually you know, become little roots that grow out of there. So this one I'm not as worried about cutting, you know, up high because I know the chance of this thing growing is, is as near to 100% as you can get. I'm going to look through that. I've got, I've got several cuttings here, larger, smaller. Um, one technique I use here, and I can do this because the soil is so loose, is I just jam it down into the soil and forget about it. You know, on a rainy day, just go take some cuttings, jam it down in there, it gets watered. And I found that these, you know, I did that one time on, on this back area of the yard. There's actually still some remnants of mulberry trees back there that I used this approach on. Had about five cuttings, just stuck them along the fence. They all grew. If you forget about those for a couple of years, you've got a lot of mulberries. But the animals and so on that live back here don't mind it. Sometimes I'll let a, I'll let a uh, hand of bananas just go to the animals, so to speak, and let them have it. All right, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do this one. So, like I said, these little green guys, I'm not gonna keep those on there. I know the chances of success are tiny, but what I'd like to get are some of these buds you can see this you can see that's and you can also kind of feel the bud to make sure it has a firmness to it meaning it's healthy and this one although it's green i'm going to go ahead and take that off too oh okay And I like the look of this one, two, three, and then we go off into here. So I'm, I'm just going to yeah, right there. Hmm. As I explore the, the possibilities here, I'm less and less impressed. I'm going to see if I can find a little bit better one. Uh, here you go. Okay. Here's what I'm going to try. Cutting like this, 
You see it's got the branches have not grown, but it's got those, those buds that are ready to turn into branches. It's got a woodiness to it. I'm gonna cut a few just like that. Now I'm not gonna get these, the part of the cutting that's got already the, the buds sprouted. And that's what, the, that's what they'll look like. They, when they start to go, they really go. But this one I don't wanna use because it's already started and I know they'll just die. Yeah, this one's, I think, the best, the best choice. Now, I'm going to put these in the water in the meantime. I'm just going to put them in the water to not get dried out. This little sprout here has got some green on the end of it. Okay, that'll be the second cutting. And you can see it's got all buds. I'll find one more good one. Yeah, I'm going to go with this one. Okay. Kept them all wet enough. Sorry, trying to not get too much water in the laptop. Okay, so three... Three cuttings. I've got another pot over here. Again, standard soil. Since these are much shorter, very easy. And there we have it. Three nice cuttings. Now it'll be interesting to see if my prediction comes true, that we have all three of these grow and probably I would say at least one of these grow, but maybe more, maybe more. Okay, so I'll put those on the grow table and we will continue to grow them. You have seven trees in your backyard. Yeah, I think I have seven mulberry trees in my backyard, but I haven't taken the, uh, the, the census lately. I've really kind of gone bananas for bananas in, in recent times. Because they are such prolific growers, but also, quite frankly, I like the fruit more than, than most others. It's also the kind of fruit that's easy to... Uh, to freeze, to, to keep for longer periods of time. So I went around and looked to see what's growing in the yard in terms of fruit. You know, if, if you have achieved the year round, then well, you should be able to go and pick things like this, which is, which is what you know, typically bananas will look like when you grow them in your backyard, if you have success. This is just a, a part of one, but this came from a musa banana tree. And you can see these bananas are not like the bananas we get at the store. And by that, I mean they are really small. Cute little banana. But this is nothing like the banana that you get at the store. And by that, I mean, it is so much sweeter than any banana you can get at the store. And to have one banana tree is great, but really I, my philosophy is to have the capability to have be able to pick bananas year round is really what you wanna to get to, but you have to devote a little bit of your yard to the banana grove because it's gonna shade everything out become fairly dense. Um, but I'm at that point. I, I When I was picking these back in the yard, I've got, hey, Backyard Tropicals, welcome. Welcome, glad to see you here. Yeah, so I counted five other banana trees that currently have fruit on them. So I think I might do a live stream where I, where I harvest those you have to keep an eye on your banana grove because especially when it's got five hands of fruit like that, because once they get ripe, 
the raccoons, the squirrels, they're coming in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they'll only eat the ripe one, which is kind of interesting. If you ever tried to eat a banana peel, you can know why. It's pretty gross, but they, they will chow them down, especially the raccoons. But they won't eat them until they're ripe. Yeah, the banana. So yeah, these are these are the Musa bananas, and I had some of the viewers explain, you know, which type of Musa there are. There are a lot of types of Musa bananas, and this is a type. Just quite frankly, I got a cutting from a friend of mine, and uh, took a pup and planted it. I know you can grow bananas from seeds, and I've never done that. I'm fascinated by that. But that Musa banana tree, that fruit there, started from one pup, from a friend, and, and I've just taken more pups as they sprout up. So a banana tree will grow from a central, it'll grow a central trunk. When it fruits, you harvest the fruit. And then the thing is, chop the tree, chop that tree down. You can think of it, you know, really bananas almost like grass. You know, they're, they're very similar to grass. And if you look at a banana tree, it almost looks like a gigantic grass plant. And uh, so you kind of mow them, you kind of take it down, but you don't leave the tree there after you took the fruit because the tree is over. But what, what it wants to do is right away start shooting up these pups from the side. And usually one or two pups will come up from, usually two or three actually now that I, Think a little bit more about it we'll start to shoot up from the base and that's the time to get the shovel in there and and take the pups out and separate them and the trick there is just to keep them watered really you know and then fertilizer and again you know what do you use for fertilizer fish waste that's my choice and you know you can use a fish itself but we have a lot of non-native species of fish just roaming in the ditches of Florida. I've rarely seen a puddle that didn't have 15 guppies in it in Florida. I, it's an amazing thing to me. Uh, but one thing that there are plentiful amounts of around here in just about any ditch, any body of water is the tilapia. Uh, so that's a type of fish I've used to you know, go catch a few tilapia and use those as, as fertilizer. But you can also, if that's not your thing, you can also just buy fish emulsion, which is quite possibly the most disgusting smell on earth. And it's funny to me how <laughs> the most disgusting thing can produce one of the most delicious and sweet tasting things. Fruit. Oh, uh-oh strangler fig in the palm tree. Yeah, I, I actually have a strangler fig up in my sable palm tree now. And I was a little concerned about that because I, I had made the false assumption that that uh, strangler figs strangle things. And as it turns out, it, it looks like it strangles things, but uh, it, it's a symbiotic relationship between the what they call a strangler fig which is actually a type of ficus uh, and the, the palm tree itself. So one way to look at it is, well, my way of looking at the strangler fig in my world is, first of all, we're not going to get rid of it. You know, I've seen people try to do that. I think you just make it angry. Uh, and it's, really kind of cool to see symbiotic relationship between plants like that, which are seem to be meant to be together. A lot of good examples of that in nature. Okay. So bananas, certainly one of the things that I found, I also went and looked again, of course, you know what I'm about to show you the Suriname cherry, another, super strong fruit that I would recommend. And if you haven't had one, uh, you should give it a go. They are wonderful. They taste almost nothing like a Bing cherry. 
and uh, slightly unusual flavor, but I love them and uh, throw them all the time. And you can see they're, they're coming in most of the year. So that's two types. And then the third thing that I found growing today is the starfruit. Now this one isn't completely ripe, but it would actually counter ripen. You just leave it on the counter and uh, it, it will ripen. There are lots, just like the, like the uh, mulberry tree, there are lots of varieties of starfruit, carambola is what they call this. And this particular variety turns orange when it's ripe, which is a little different than some of the varieties, but there's a really a, a wide variance in the flavor of these things. So I've had starfruit that tastes something like, you know, very watery and it's like sweet water, but barely to something that is, you know, much more sweet and almost like peach kind of flavor. And that's what this tastes like. So if you're going to buy a starfruit tree, a carambola, oh, that's nice, the wind. We've got a pretty steady onshore wind today, which is pretty nice. If we're going to purchase one of these, I'll get some seeds. They grow very easily from seeds. In fact, I planted some over in the, the uh, grow table over there. I'd recommend that you, you try the fruit first or at least get one that people say the fruit is excellent. You're going to invest your time and in, in space in your yard. So why not get something that you know that you have a higher chance of succeeding with? I have uh, only one type of carambola in my yard, but I found growing them from seeds works almost every time. Okay. Now I did recently try to eat a banana flower and I had a lot of comments from folks that said that there are certain cultures like in the Philippines and, and uh, some other places that, that it's very common to eat banana flowers. Now this is the banana flower that actually came off of this very small hand of bananas. And you can see it's in, small. I have other banana flowers up there that I'm going to attempt to eat. I did actually release a video where I tried to eat one and found out that it was kind of rotten inside. But yeah, that's a, that's a banana flower. And one thing I'll tell you about banana flowers is that kids love them. <laughs> Just love to peel them back. It's like the artichoke of the fruit world. Did you just hear that? I believe gravity just pulled one of those papayas off the tree. Yeah, so this one obviously is not, you know, this, this banana tree was not full force. Wow, 11 hand bunch hanging right now, backyard tropicals. Sweet. Oh, hey, big cat. <laughs> yeah, so I peeled back one of these leaves and the same thing that I encountered in my first attempt to eat one is happening here. These, these are the flowers, which would have turned into bananas if they had said, but, uh, and they're brown. You know, they're kind of rotten, so. They don't smell bad, but they're certainly, these are like bananas that will never be. But this one's not the choice for, for eating, for sure. And then, as a matter of fact, uh, if you are going to eat them, what I've been told by folks on the channel is, you know, remove the outer layers and it's the inner part that that is uh, what you eat. And in fact, you, you cook it. So I'm going to make another video here where I go ahead and eat one, but let's do a cross section of this. Now, banana sap, insidious. You get this stuff on your clothes, it's gonna stain it. Yeah, and you can see this is not a winner. It's got that brown part and I'm gonna try not to drip banana sap into the keyboard, that's a killer for sure. Uh, yeah, and again, natural mulch. Yeah, yeah, that's quitty. No doubt, the banana flower is cool. 
So as I was coming back from my daughter's volleyball game, which was super fun, I drove by a lot that had been converted, has recently been converted into a, it looks like an edible fruit area. They've got all kinds of things growing there. So actually on my way back for the second volleyball game, I'm going to stop by there and see if they might be interested in uh, getting involved with this channel. But we'll see. That, that got me excited. There are a couple of things going on that I think there's a actually kind of a higher interest in growing your own food recently, which is a positive sign to me. I think any time, you know, we're going to talk about improving the world to me. Uh, let's start with what we put in to our bodies, you know, and uh, I think it's pretty important to have nutritious food. It's also kind of important to know where your food comes from uh, and have it be whole food whenever you can, right? We're all going to end up just hitting that Taco Bell <laughs> if we have to, but um, the idea of from your, from a seed to a fruit to you is something that, uh, you know, I think uh, it is something that we all can appreciate having in our lives. Yeah, and I like, I've always liked raw stuff. I grew up in a very rural area and a lot of fond memories of that, but I spent, I, can't, I have some of my fondest memories as a kid were just walking around in the fields. My grandfather had all kinds that we lived next to my grandfather's house. Um, and just to wander through the fields and pick vegetables. <laughs> so I'd wander through the cornfield and pick you know, little baby corn or big corn and eat them, just raw, eat tomatoes off the vine, eat peppers, asparagus, whatever it was growing, you know, especially if you get the little, you know, when they're little you know, baby vegetables, I just eat the vegetables like crazy. I, I love raw vegetables, raw fruit, really love it. Yeah, that's right. It, it'd be great if we had more of a sense of having food in your community. There's this concept of food deserts, right, where you don't have nutritious food in areas, which is a serious problem. You know, um, if, we don't, if we're not, we're talking about fertilizing plants, but we should fertilize ourselves as well. And uh, we fertilize ourselves with good food. And I I don't think we're ever going to regret having food just growing around. You know, it's easy when we're in times of plenty, you know, which we certainly have a lot to be grateful for in terms of uh, living in this country and having so much bounty. But um, yeah, well, we're not going to regret having the ability to have food on hand, you know, and the more we can do that, the better. You know, some of the arguments you'll hear as well, it draws in the rats or it's, you know, it's dirty or, you know, whatever the, the deal is. And uh, these are really signs of a, of a uh, society that might not be completely getting where this food's coming from. You know, eventually, the grocery store is probably not the best long-term play. <laughs> get a cat yeah i don't have to get a cat because i've got so many of them already just roaming around again in that where i had grown up in this rural area i saw many times people drive down this road that we lived on and out would go a cat out the side of the truck or whatever you know there and so i would say it wasn't uncommon to have 25, 30 cats uh, that were just roaming the, the area. And the reason they roamed the area is because my grandmother fed them. And uh, I can remember in the mornings her coming out with, the, with a pan of cat food and having 15 cats all with their tails up near just following her to the barn. They all lived outside. And, uh, you know, they, they actually had kind of tough time in the winter, I think, but, but, uh, 
yeah, occasionally I would hear the cats dealing with the rat population in the barn. And uh, those rats were as big as cats. Yeah, so I think I was thinking maybe I would pick one of those papaya. As you can see, there's more papaya than I know what to do with. Again, a great producer. <laughs> they did that with your aunt. Yeah, the Pied Piper. I love cats. But I like them outside. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to do it. We're going to go with the flow. We got the tropical breezes blowing in. And uh, they seem to be telling me in some weird way, pick a papaya. So let's go ahead and do that. I, I actually have had different fruit picking devices. This one right here that you see propped up in that tree form, Dracaena, is one that that I love a lot. I got this telescoping you know, fruit picker. And that's the only way you're going to get those fruit without chopping that thing down. It's a good 25 feet up there. And uh, you got to have a good picker. Majesty palm tree. Yeah, I'm craving a coconut tree in my yard. And uh, I used to have a great yellow Malaysian coconut tree, which is a dwarf variety of coconut tree. Unfortunately, it got a type of pest on it. Kind of like a white fly type of deal and uh, started to just rain sap down on my wife's car. So we had to, you know, we can't tolerate that too well and I could have and here's the thing climb the papaya tree <laughs> that uh, I could that's exactly the stream of thought that I typically get into and I find myself climbing a papaya tree and then I realize only as the papaya tree begins to tip the error of my ways I was so distracted by that, I <laughs> lost my train of thought, but let's get right back to it. I'm going to go ahead and pick a papaya tree. I'm going to try to angle this so you can see it. And the funny thing is, my neighbor next door, uh, I, I planted a papaya tree kind of on the fence, right near the fence, which you know, is questionable. Really, I think, you know, planting stuff against your fence near your neighbor's yard, but uh, they're super cool and obviously I'm not able to pick every papaya they fall down and I think some fell into their yard and I saw I see now that there's one growing up on the other side of the fence and I thought that's so cool <laughs> the, the, the fruit jungle is expanding its tendrils and people are allowing it to happen <laughs> imagine if everybody had a yard backyard they could eat I like that idea a lot. All right, I'm going to go pick one. Let's just do this and kind of angle it up there. I want to get one of those high, high level. You can see this particular telescoping technology. <laughs> Is exactly what you need. Okay. Uh, cool thing about this one is that it comes with a rubberized cover on the, the picker and then has this little foam on the bottom to you know to prevent it from getting bruised because especially these papaya they're very delicate. Okay here we go.
There it is. Now, this is another sappy one. Papayas have this white, milky sap, which I'm going to be extra careful not to drip into the laptop. Let's see. A little bit drip down here. Now, obviously, not ripe. These will turn yellow when they're ripe. But look at how much food is there. It's bigger than my hand. And these ripen beautifully on the counter. So, I mean, if I were to spend 10 minutes picking papaya, I'd have three five-gallon buckets full of papaya. And again, that's no big deal until it is. You know, but we're never going to regret having too much food. I don't think. If we're regretting that, we're probably figuring out things to be upset about. Climbing coconut palms. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, back here, tropicals. You've never seen a papaya pick. That's so cool. Novelty. Yeah, the banana trees do have a lot of sap. Uh, very sticky, for sure. Um, the banana tree sap, I've got, I've got some actually on the table here. <laughs> It almost has like a brownish color to it, but it, again, very sticky, produces a, a really intense stain on any clothes it gets on. But the papaya, very milky sap. Now, the papaya tree, as they call it, is actually a vegetable. So, you know, one of the things I, I love is, you know, the idea of of medicinal plants and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things that I saw recently in a local spot that I go to to get, you know, valerian root, chamomile tea and stuff like that was papaya leaf. And so I looked that up and as it turns out, there are a lot of, uh, you know, claims of benefits from papaya leaf. You know, dried and made into tea or just ingested. I, I've never taken it. I'm not saying you should, but if it's good for you, <laughs> we got plenty. Banana blood, Zig. Oh, I like that. You know, I was in a band in college called, ban no, I wasn't in a band called Banana Blood, but if I were to make a band, I think I'd call it Banana Blood. In fact, I might have to call this video Banana Blood. So I'm going to show you the banana, the papaya leaf. The, the interesting thing about that papaya there is very tall, very wide trunk now, this giant Hawaiian papaya. But if you, if you chop that in half, what you'll find is that it's hollow. I mean, maybe this much of a wall and then you know, this much inside of it hollow. And uh, actually very heavy too. <laughs> yeah, don't confirm any claims. That's right. Don't do anything on my advice. <laughs> mm. Let's pick up a pie leaf. Why not? If not now, then when? Oh, and by the way, I don't know if you noticed, as I was trying to pick that papaya, it was actually taller than the ability of my... So I, it's now taller than the longest picker I could find. I'll have to figure that out. See that? Oh, you can see. I'm going to readjust it. Yeah, I'm under my chocolate pudding fruit tree. Here you can see it right there. Enjoying the shade. There's no way I could do this out in the rest of the yard without just raining sweat. But yeah, you can see that pie tree against the beautiful blue sky. It's today and let's go ahead and pick a pick a papaya leaf i'd like to get one that has act that you could see the whole structure of it in the side Oh. 
That didn't work out exactly like I had hoped, but good enough. Here we go. Now that's a leaf. Holy moly. Kidding me? Yeah. So if this stuff is good for you, and I don't say it is, but if it is, well, then we got plenty of it. And I'll tell you this much. As these things... GoPro, yeah, action papaya. I'll put a GoPro on the end of the picker. Of course, it'd be really anticlimactic when the picker isn't long enough to get to the papaya, but you just are yearning, but you never do. Yeah, so when I picked it, it broke, but you could see all I did was just kind of hook that hook around and pull it, and that's what broke this. But let's take a look at just this part first. Okay, I'm going to just cut this. Do you hear that? Yeah, papaya. Pretty cool. Papaya leaf tea time. Don't tempt me. Or, or tempt me. No, actually, I take that back. Tempt me. right down the rabbit hole. Now these things have a lot of excellent uses. Just out of reach, I know. Uh. Yeah, they have a lot of uses. But one of my top recommended uses is to have sword fights with your six-year-old son because they make excellent, like a papaya, you know, uh, lightsaber. And uh, the fun thing is they break very easily. So it's not like uh, it's the best kind of thing to do, a, you know, recreate the Darth Vader versus Obi-Wan uh, experience. And, but, you know, the hardest thing really is to decide, are you Darth Vader or are you Obi-Wan? Depends on the day, maybe. Would they make a good fishing pole? No, these would not. These would not um, make a good fishing pole just because they're so incredibly uh, brittle. And you'd almost think they would make a poor, I would think they would make a poor plant choice for for uh, where I live just because we have so much sea breeze you know, all the time. And then we have these heavy wind events like hurricanes and so on, tropical storms. And you'd almost think it would be a bad choice just because they're so delicate. And the banana's a lot like that too. Those banana leaves, when it gets very windy, they just get shredded. I mean, they just shred, but they grow so quickly that, uh, you know, you only have to tolerate it for a couple of weeks and then they're back full steam. This one got whipped by a hurricane about, not a hurricane, but a heavy wind event. It was a hurricane. It's a hurricane that was in the Gulf, but, um, yeah, shredded up, came back. No problem. And uh, you can tell these, these leaves, you know, I've got some, some damage to them, but not too bad. Now, the thing is, I always want to smell things. But, you know, we're talking about bananas and papayas. And <laughs> the, how do you enjoy fruit? There's a lot, of, a lot of things to enjoy about fruit and growing things in your backyard. I talked about the variety of, of things that you can enjoy, but then there's a lot of other things, the color, but also the smell of these things. The smell of a, of a papaya is unusual, to say the least. Certainly not encouraging you to eat the fruit, but the fruit, once ripe, Radically different. Oh. Yeah. How do you know so much about trees? <laughs> I don't actually think I know a lot about trees. I've just spent a lot of time planting things. And you know what really, now that I think about that question, that's a great question. Which first of all, I'll say, I only know what I've learned through experience. And 
my experience has been trying and failing a lot. You know, most of the best things I've learned, not just in how to grow trees, but how to live life is through failure, right? So if you don't fail, you're probably, if you don't lose, you're probably not going to win. If you don't uh, you know, fail at growing things, you're probably not going to know how to really grow things, right? Because, you know, it's through that trial and error. And if you're in a challenging environment like here, a coastal environment where there's a lot of saltiness and a lot of fruit trees don't like that saltiness, uh, you know, you've got to find things that can live on that, that middle way of this environment, be able to deal with the salt, be able to grow fast enough, et cetera, et cetera. So I try not to force anything to grow here. So if something is too difficult or it's just, you know, to, if it's going to require me to apply pesticides to it or, you know, over fertilize it constantly or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I really, I just, I can't hang with that. It's not, it's not for me. So everything that I have here is a result of the things which made it. But what you don't see behind me are all the things that didn't make it. Like many types of citrus trees, like actually a one type of mango tree I had tried back here. Nem Doc Mai was the type that I tried to just was not having it. You know, so there's certain types of trees. And, and then, you know, when the trees start to get a little, when they start to get a funk, you know, I, is to try some natural things. But if they, if they don't make it, they don't make it. It's just, to me, I try to say it's, it's a way to, it's kind of pushing you towards what works in your yard. And Half the fun of this is just trying it for me. Are you able to stunt the height of the papaya tree with trimming? Not possible if you need a dwarf variety uh, if you don't want that height. That's another good question. Yeah, thanks, Nightbird. Uh, no, I don't think you're going to be able to stunt the growth of it through trimming, although I have not tried that. I haven't tried to say top the, the papaya tree, but I, I wouldn't try just because it is hollow and it's been tried for me. So I've had hurricanes snap them over and they haven't done well. And what I mean is, although they will produce these sucker, you know, what I call suckers, these little side growths, uh, they, uh, the, the trunk itself is cut. And again, it's this hollow trunk it's a lot like this this uh, stem and the water gathers in there and it becomes well here it became like a putrid gross experience and um, then the fruit then it eventually died but you know anything here that is that is holding water in it is going to be infested with mosquitoes and that's not what you want so no I don't think I don't think you'd want to try to stunt it now Stunt the growth. I, when you said stun, I thought you meant actually like do a stunt by climbing the papaya. <laughs> um, I don't think you'd want to do that. I think you'd want to find a variety that is naturally shorter. And that, that was to the point of the coconut tree that I was talking about earlier. And, you know, the yellow Malaysian being much smaller. Typically what you'll find if you go to purchase a coconut tree is the one that's going to get 60 to 80 feet tall which is really cool. Like if you're on a tropical island and it's curving out over the cerulean blue sea and so forth, but really it's probably growing next to your driveway and dropping bombs on your car. So, <laughs> or it's so tall that to get the coconut out of it is a act of um, supreme athleticism, let's say, and risk taking. You know, I obviously I didn't, you know, I wasn't uh, growing up in a place where I was climbing coconut trees, although that sounds pretty cool. Mostly climbing apple trees. You said you've never tasted a coconut. Wow. Well, congratulations. You get to experience the coconut for the first time. You're, somebody said, I've never had ice cream. I'm envious. 
to experience that for the first time is amazing. So, yeah, I look forward to that. Now, I've got several neighbors that have green coconut trees around here, and I'm sure they'd be willing to give me a nut or two. Probably, they'd probably, most of them would probably say, just go ahead and clean it off. I appreciate it. Um, take the whole thing. As some of them might say, all the coconuts. Because there's really a limit to how many coconuts you can eat. When I had my Malaysian coconut tree out front, uh, I, a lot of the times I'd have people come by and knock and say, you know, they're <laughs> it's very nice. I guess people don't always knock. I had all my dragon fruit stolen <laughs> recently, uh, <laughs> which is fun, I guess. Um, yeah, they knock and say, hey, do you mind if I take some coconuts? The one guy said, yeah, I'm gonna, I love to make rum drinks with coconuts. Said, yeah, go for it. This guy from Puerto Rico. And that's a cool way to connect with people, too. You know, I, the, these, you know, I was excited by this experience this morning, to be honest. Where, you know, is it just kind of knock on a neighbor's door that, ha, you know, has a tree I appreciate and you share a common interest and say, hey, it's okay. And they check, it's okay. And now you, you found a, a cool way to share and be connected with people in your community. I like that. I like that a lot. Just that part of it. Just the fact that, you know, we're, we're attracted to growing things. We share a common interest. In the Philippines, they call coconuts widow makers. <laughs> yeah, my oak tree almost made a widow. <laughs> yeah, since they have killed people when they fall on their heads. Yeah, that's right. They are heavy. I mean, really heavy and really dense. So... You know, what's the uh, the falling height of a coconut that would become fatal to a person? I claim it doesn't have to be that tall. And when you're talking about something that has that can potentially get 70, 80 feet tall, now it's just timing. If you're under that thing at the wrong moment, you know, it's time, uh, time out. Yeah, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. But, of course, the Malaysian, the yellow Malaysian coconut is a, is a prime one, but... Not so easy to locate at your local nursery, which is why, you know, online is the option. Uh, I found a couple places online where you can get them, so I might end up doing that. Uh, one of the things is that I, well, one of the things that I'm interested in is to plant coconuts on, near my curb. But the problem is, you know, the spread of the fronds can really be wide, and I don't really like to take palm trees and keep them continuously you know, just take off all the lower growth. It's not really that great for the palm tree. It can tend to kind of sap it. So I don't know. I'm still thinking it through. The papayas in Vietnam are shorter, more branches, very sweet. That's cool. Yeah. I'd love to try one. Does the mango tree drop sap? yes every time i've picked in fact we do a thing where we pick the mangoes in the yard and the tommy atkins is so sappy that the tommy atkins mango tree is so much sap in it that when you snap it off of the stalk that it's growing on it will it actually squirts sap out like actively pumps sap out of the mango is how sappy they are. I've never seen any other type of fruit do that. But the mango, I've seen it almost every time. The Hayden isn't quite like that. I've got a Hayden mango tree uh, over here. But the Tommy Atkins, so much sap. So what we do when we pick these Tommy Atkins mangoes is snap it off, kind of angle it away because it's like a mango sap squirt gun. Again, another terrific band name, mango sap squirt gun. Um, but point it away so that the sap doesn't spray all over you. Another type of sap you don't want to get on you. It just stains and never comes out. Um, but I, then I will turn it upside down and just let the, let the sap drip out and then put it into the, into the bucket just so that everything isn't covered in that mango sap. And uh, 
one little fun fact about mangoes is that the the sap can be really uh really tough for some people it's uh, almost like a poison ivy effect i know my daughter ha has uh, that effect it has that effect with her um, she can eat the fruit just fine but the sap that comes out of the or even on the skin the sap on the skin of the mango itself is uh you know has an effect on sensitive skin so it's a, the mango is just such a unusual fruit it's, to me it's the king of fruits you know i've I often tell the story, and if you've heard me say it before, I uh, apologize for being repetitive, but, you know, I've heard the story, and I just like this story. Oh, look at that. There's a beautiful butterfly flying around my tree for in right now. But the mango, I hope it flies behind me. Oh, it did. There it is. Butterflies. The fruit of kings that, and I don't know if this story is true, doesn't really matter, <laughs> as in most stories, that wars were fought over varieties of mango trees. And I'll tell you, if you're a mango nut like me, and I have several friends who are the same way, share a bizarre love of mango trees, it's really not hard to imagine how people could get into that situation. It's such an unusual fruit and so incredibly delicious, but it snowed where you are yesterday. Wow. Yeah. The Impala in the driveway. Holy moly. That is so hard for me to conceptualize. I used to, oh, yeah, back in college and so on, 30 years ago, I would, I surfed in, I surfed in New England through New England winters, with full wetsuits on, walking through snow to the ocean and so on and so forth, and I was fine, but uh, after living in Florida for as long as I have, I can't even go to Southern California without feeling cold, so, or maybe that's just getting older. Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of sap coming out of those mango trees, that's for sure. And you want to be careful if you're sensitive to, to saps of plants. You know, I, I know poison ivy, I was always told some people are allergic to it, some people aren't. I've walked through poison ivy mistakenly and gotten it on my skin and never had a reaction to it, where the friend next to me that walked through it was down for the count of the horrible poison ivy experience. So... Yeah, I just, I guess I've got a lot of thoughts on mango sap. <laughs> yeah, Nightbird, the joy of sharing fruit. But nobody wanted the, nobody wanted persimmons? Oh, the non-astringent variety. Yeah, astringent fruit. That That's an interesting topic to me as well stringent fruit and a lot of types of fruit come to mind when you say stringent uh and in fact there's one i was planning on i saw one growing wild which is the uh not the natal plum well the natal plum is another type of astringent fruit that i love i, I don't mind the astringent flavor you know that kind of mm, that weird <laughs> astringent uh the java plum is a type of very astringent fruit that I have experimented with over the years, and uh, I'm going to do it again. Even though the last one I, I had actually grown a java plum uh, in my yard years ago, took a seed, planted it. You know, five years later, the trunk was this big, and it was going for the sky. Those things are just massive. In that period of time, I actually built a small tree fort, and actually, I think Julian and Jonathan are on the chat maybe, but <laughs> if you don't remember... It grew so fast that I was able, and it's actually strong enough to build a small little platform up in the tree, but it was just growing so fast that I, I had to, uh, I had to get rid of it. But I, again, now I long for it. So I'm going to try to grow another Java plum tree, but that, that's another type of example of a, you know, red, delicious plum like fruit, but it does give you that very heavy astringent flavor, which puts a lot of people off. If you're expecting 
a peach and you get a persimmon, not so good. Yeah, but sharing fruit, I mean, sharing anything, you know, sharing time, this. It's excellent. Yeah, mangoes written into lore. Yeah, I, I love to imagine that. I don't want to imagine that there's war, but I mean, I, I love to imagine the idea of the hero's journey. You know, like there's this treasure and you, maybe this awesome variety of mango being hoarded by some evil king and, the, you know, we go and, and liberate it and give the mangoes to the world or whatever. You know. I, I like the story. Where's Jack? <laughs> I, yeah, Jack is at his friend's house. He had a birthday party, so he's over there probably eating birthday cake and getting nutty, I hope. But uh, yeah, he's definitely going to be part of future streams. He's just got a pretty full dance card. Yeah, war against trees. Which tree will win? Hmm. Most powerful fruit tree. Oh, that's a really good question. I'd almost have to say the most resilient fruit tree would win, meaning the thing that, you know, what's the cockroach of fruit trees? What's the thing that's going to make it through all kinds of adverse conditions? And I would kind of lean towards, you know, whatever grows fastest, most fast, fastest. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'd have to give it probably to, uh, probably to something like a mulberry tree, just because of the speed of growth, you know, and the, the fact that, especially the ever-bearing mulberry tree, that variety in particular, uh, just because it, it, its range of growth is you know, something you can grow certainly far north in uh, you know in America, far north, but also will grow in southern regions. I'm down here in central Florida, and and uh, you know I know people growing them even down in Miami. So it's you know, it's a wide ranging. One thing I've thought of is if I only had one type of tree in this yard and, you know, for what purpose, but for the purpose of eating, you know, if, if you had to live off the land of your yard, what would be the pick? And again, I think it would be something like the mulberry. And the reason is not just the resiliency in that case, it's that, that it's also edible in many ways, you know, the, the leaves, the, and although they may not taste good here, there's a point where we're all hungry enough to eat those leaves. Hey, we're having mulberry leaf salad for dinner, kids. Mmm. Yeah. Okay, so we never really finished the papaya leaf experience, but there's a few other qualities of the papaya that are quite interesting to me. And these leaves are very, very brittle. Again, they have that, that strange smell to them, but I like plants that have the leaf that just disintegrates. And these definitely do that. The leaf disintegrates. This, this part will turn into dust and back to the dirt in no time. But what remains are a lot of the sticks. And you can see around the base here, it's probably kind of hard to see, but there are sticks laying down there. So those end up needing to be picked up. They last a little longer, but the rest usually fade away pretty quickly. Okay, well, this was super fun. I can't wait to do it again next week, but I think I'm going to do some more live streams during the week. I just realized I'm a little late for my volleyball game and I'm feeling bad about that, <laughs> but this was so fun. 
So I'm going to do it again next weekend, but I'm also going to do some more during the week. So I'll try to get them posted so that if you're interested in, uh, in joining in, you can. So yeah, thanks for showing up. I appreciate all of you sending out positive vibes to the world. I hope your day goes well. I hope you're prosperous in every way. I hope your wildest dreams come true and all the things you desire manifest. Have a great one. Go ahead, eat your backyard. Why not? Have a good one.